Finn. He has recently ascended to executive directorship of the Bitcoin Foundation. This is sort of the main Bitcoin body. And he's going to give a speech here about sort of Bitcoins for all levels. So Bruce Fenton. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. You'll forgive me, this is my first uh, time out since a bad car accident I had in early May, so I won't be as, uh, if you're expecting uh, Andreas uh, Antonopoulos, uh, you'll, you may be disappointed. <laughs> I may not be as uh, uh, polished as I would normally be, but I'm going to talk about a few, a few things, um, and we'll leave plenty of time for questions. The audience, as always, with Liberty Events is fairly mixed. We have, uh, well, let's, let's actually just do a quick, quick little poll. How, how many people would would consider yourselves Bitcoin experts? Couple, okay. Uh, who is brand new to Bitcoin? Ah, okay, okay. And then everybody else, I take it somewhere in between? Okay, all right, so that's what I'm talking about. Um, so I didn't realize there'd be so many new newcomers, so I'll, I'll very, very quickly just cover what, what Bitcoin is, how it works. Um, and bear with me if you've heard this five or 10 or 100 times. Uh, I find it actually useful to, to talk about the basics because it is so hard to really grasp. I still haven't figured out a way to, to explain Bitcoin in an elevator pitch because it is a, a very unusual concept. I was talking to a reporter about a week ago and he was asking about how you can make it more simple. I haven't seen anybody really successfully do it. It's one of those things you have to sort of see and experience to understand. And it reminded me of... Um, the very first time I showed somebody what email was. And uh, as simple as it seems now, it was kind of hard to understand uh, at the time to say, OK, it's like a letter, but you don't mail it in the mail. You put it on a computer, and the other person sees it on their computer. And I remember I was a client of mine in the investment business I showed, and he was right over my shoulder. And we had somebody on the other end who would respond right away. And it was, he was like, wow, that's incredible. And that's sort of the way Bitcoin is. It's, it's kind of like something you have to see and experience. It's not something you can get because it is such an unusual and new concept. It's not something you can usually get in 30 seconds. But the basics with, with Bitcoin is what, what Bitcoin is, is essentially it's, it's a, the email of money, basically. It is, and at its core, what it is, is a ledger, all right? The ledger in Bitcoin is called the blockchain. And if you think about what a ledger is, a ledger is basically a statement of truth. How do you know you're, you are allowed to be here? Who has an armband? Probably everybody, right? Well, that's a form of a ledger. They had to get your name and registration. If you work at a company, how do you know you really work there? How does Rogers really know that you have a campsite or you are supposed to have a key to your hotel room? Uh, if, you, if you work at Microsoft, how does Microsoft really know you're an employee? Uh, there are hedge fund managers that have made a billion dollars in a day. That's a ledger entry from one account to another account, making somebody a billion dollars in one day. Simply ledger entry. Everything in our world really revolves around ledger entries, which are basically statements of truth. It's a statement of truth if Roger says, yes, you are in room 20 and you are authorized to have a key. That's a ledger entry. And, it's, and, and it is the same principle that would go behind Bank of America saying this hedge fund manager just made a billion dollars or uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has $25 billion. Why, why do we know he really owns those shares? How do we know Facebook has value? It's all ledger. And we've had ledgers for ages in humanity. And all of this time, all of these centuries, you have needed a trusted third party to say that that really is a true statement. Whether it's the people at the registration desk or Rogers Campground or Bank of America or JP Morgan or our good friends, the United States government. Someone has served as, a, as an objective party to say that a statement is true. So a brilliant person named Satoshi Nakamoto took a lot of other brilliant ideas from other people and came up with this idea to say, OK, why can't we just kind of open source this ledger? And I like to think of it as, what if you had a big master ledger of who owned what, 
let's call it money for an example, and you put it in the town square. You said, we don't, we don't need to trust uh, the registration desk or Bank of America or anybody else. We're just gonna have a big giant book. We're gonna put it in a nice safe place right over here. Everybody's gonna say what you own. I own $10,000 and I'm gonna give you five and you have five now. Well, that's cool. A couple problems with that. One, the physical ability to go and access that. Another is security and privacy. So, okay, we take that book and we put it on the internet for everyone to see. We kind of open source it, let anybody access it, like we would access uh, you know, file sharing. Well, that, that solves a lot of the problem, and that technology has existed for some time now. But another challenge was, do we really want to say, Bruce Fenton has $10,000, I give $5,000 to you, and your name is on there. I, I may not want that, you may not want that. So combining this concept of this open ledger and combining cryptography to make it uh, secure and make it so that it is tracked by mathematics rather than identity, the Bitcoin blockchain, which is maybe the world's greatest ledger, or certainly capability to be one of the most interesting and innovative and amazing ledgers that's ever existed, can say, I have this long number, you know, 18376, capital A, H, whatever, and you have a number, and this ledger entry says that I own uh, 30 Bitcoin, and I'm gonna give you 10 Bitcoin. And then that is a statement of truth that is proven and since it's open source, there's a million computers that can download that and see that as a statement of truth. So it's actually a more solid statement of truth than something like Bank of America. And as, as much as we can criticize these large organizations that none of us are fans of, whereas the massive banks or certainly governments, uh, their ledger entries are, are usually pretty solid. If, if Bank of America says you have a billion dollars, you almost always do. But as stable as they may be, this, this ledger is more stable because you are not relying on, a, on another party. And with that comes a lot of other benefits. You don't have, since you're not trusting that third party, there's more to it than just saying, uh, you know, I don't really trust that Zuckerberg has 25 billion because Goldman Sachs says he owns those shares. Yeah, that's not a real major concern. We pretty much know that that uh, despite their faults, the ledgers of the major banks and things like share ownership and major cash ownership are pretty accurate. But there's all kinds of other problems with it, with having a trusted third party. There's the problems of, of failure, and nobody ever thinks they're gonna fail. People in Cyprus didn't think their economy was gonna fail, and then one day the government just said, you know what, we're taking 20 or more percent of your money right out of your account, it's ours now. It's a similar thing is happening in Greece. In the United States, we've had things like that happen where people weren't allowed to own gold, and all, uh, many people in this room you, you know well. Um, and even in our own financial collapse in uh, 2008, if you owned certain uh, funds, if you were with Lehman Brothers, which was a 100-plus-year-old organization, and it collapsed, when it collapsed, uh, not everybody lost their money. Some people had a very, very difficult time getting their money back. Some people did just lose their money. Uh, if you were with Putnam Funds, the Putnam Prime Fund, and a couple other funds, uh, at the very least, your money was tied up for a long time, even in what is considered by many to be one of the most stable economies. And then you have another problem with trusted third parties, which is they can be co-opted by other third parties. Um, there was, in the post-9-11 hysteria, where a lot of bad decisions were made as a result of this horrible tragedy of 9-11, one not-so-bright person in the government got the idea and said, well, let's, uh, let's freeze all the money of all the Muslims. And somebody else who maybe was a little smarter said, well, you know, we don't, we don't ask religion in America on your bank account forms. So how do we do it? He said, I don't know. Let's seize everybody's money who's named Muhammad. This is a true story. Uh, it, which, by the way, is the most common name in the world. It's more common than Timothy. If you would have seized everybody's name Timothy after uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, it would have been more fair because at least there's not quite as many people. So the most common name in the world, they actually froze 
almost all of these people's money in some form, basically everybody named Muhammad and a few other names. For a period, luckily, someone just a little bit smarter in government figured out, wow, that kind of breaks uh, many, many laws, including the Constitution and has numerous other problems. And they sort of backed down from this. But there was indeed American people who had their money frozen because their name sounded like the same religion of the people who were credited with attacking us. So that's just an example, and, and we all know well in these circles of the many, many examples of baffling incompetence, corruption, and other things that occur with governments and giant organizations that, uh, and some people right in this room can speak well to uh, the human tragedy that, the, that these kind of baffling actions can occur. So that's one of the great benefits of, of being free from this, this central third party control. And, um, and another one is just the, the concept of saying, if we were to design, well, not, not we, but if normal people um, were, were, were out there to, and you walked to the man on the street and said, hey, design the best government, whether they're statist, Republican, Democrat, independent, whatever they identify themselves in. If you said, you know, I identify the things that you really think a, the perfect government would do. Even, even the, the statist leaning people probably wouldn't, it wouldn't occur to them to say, yeah, monetary policy. Absolutely, we need, we need government to control money. Um, in, in this audience, certainly not. And, and a lot of other people, it's just, it's just not something most people would come up with. Yet, we, we sort of accept this fact that, you know, we need someone else to control money. So what Bitcoin does through this incredible ledger, it enables you to have these statements of truth of who owns what in, in a way that makes it completely independent from any trusted third party. And that has incredible implications. The invention of this blockchain technology can change the world. It can change the way insurance and any, any other thing where a trusted third party is needed can and I think will be changed by this technology. And meanwhile, this, you notice I haven't talked that much about Bitcoin itself, the currency. This currency, which is the first and most major successful application of this decentralized ledger, is really cool as well. It, it enables you to transfer money instantly without knowing who the other party is or them knowing who you are, without any identi identity verification, without uh, a lot of friction in a very simple way. And uh, it, it has a ways to go in some ways. There are, um, it is early technology. I would say it's kind of like, when I use the email example, it may be like, if you remember, how many people had one of the early email addresses that was just a long string of numbers that looked like a Bitcoin address? Even Prodigy, and I think maybe even AOL, the very first iteration of AOL was these long addresses. And AOL was one of the first to innovate and say, you can have your name, BruceFenton at AOL.com. Which people are like, wow, that is incredible <laughs> now, to be able to choose your own, and not have this long string. And uh, of course, you couldn't email people. You know, there was nobody had email, so you, you, you and your one friend who had email could use that that name, and and he or she wouldn't have to remember the long string. Um, so, so that's um, that ability to to transfer money instantly. It ba basically is like email for money, and if we look and say, how come 20 years ago when email was first starting to be used, why couldn't I have just emailed you and said, uh, here Bernard, here's $10,000. And he could say, oh, I trust Bruce, this is good. And then he gives it to somebody, well, well, it doesn't matter if he trusts me, you need somebody else to say it. And, th and now we have this ledger. So it's a big deal, and it's, as I said, it has a ways to go. I think we're kind of like these early days, there are some things that are clunky, um, here we have a lot of vendors that accept Bitcoin, but you see some of the challenges with it. Um, even for myself, I like to spend Bitcoin, of course. You know, we have Wi-Fi and other, you know, just other things that will be, I think will go away in the coming one, two, three, four, five years. And it will be uh, easier than cash in every way. In some ways, it already is superior. There are certain things like, um, you know, transferring money over distances, where Bitcoin is absolutely superior. When I deal with a lot of Bitcoin people, of course, and I do things like uh, 
you know, events and, you know, I'm doing different deals and things like that. And I have a lot of friends where we owe each other some money or whatever. And, and uh, Bitcoin is vastly superior for those kind of things. For me to have the ability to go to a friend and the friend says, hey, here's the address. Oh, yeah, here's that cash I owe you. And they get it. That, that's a big deal. So there are certain things where Bitcoin is already clearly totally superior form of money. And overall, I think those benefits make it an overall superior form of money. And these other things where it is a shortfall, I think will be fixed. And the reason I think that is because there's almost more money going in venture capital money into Bitcoin than any other area. It's huge, huge investments, very serious investments now, where just a couple of years ago, I, um, I went to a conference like this and I had gone, I've come from the investment business and I had been to hundreds of investment conferences. I said, well, let's be a little casual. I'm going to go without the tie. And I did kind of the jacket and pants thing. And I walked into that conference and I said, oh boy. And I kind of took the jacket off and <laughs> tucked it on a shirt <laughs> because uh, having a jacket just didn't fit in. Um, and then it changed quickly, you know, within a few months, then you saw a few people with jackets, and one people said, there's venture capitalists here. Those guys with suits in the front. And everybody's kind of like, really? They're here? Why? Why? Are they going to invest in a Bitcoin business? Couldn't believe it. And then shortly after that, BitPay was doing their uh, $2 million round. My friend Jason and I were here, and we saw them. They had their uh, Lamborghini parked out front in, in Miami. And uh, that, was, that was one of the first serious companies right around the time Coinbase. You know, it's like, wow, real companies are actually raising real money. Well, since then, these companies like BitPay and Coinbase have raised uh, you know, many raises and they place their valuation well over the $100 million range. And we see really serious players entering the space like Circle where the entrepreneurs running it have run very, very successful companies in the past. And you see more really serious people leaving big, big jobs from Facebook, Google, other leading companies and going into this space. And you see a lot more five and 10 and $20 million raises. You had one company where their original seed round was over $100 million, uh, this company called 21. So all of these engineers and all of these geniuses and all of these entrepreneurs and developers and CEOs that are backed by some of the brightest venture capitalists in the world, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, was the one who made that $100 million investment. You know, this is the guy who um, basically invented the web browser as we know it, then went over to AOL, he backed, I believe, Twitter, Facebook, um, maybe Dropbox, a whole bunch of really, really big, big names in the tech space. So these are the kind of people backing this. And you have now hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people that are jumping into this. And no one needs permission. As Gavin Andreessen, who's the chief scientist of our organization, the, the Bitcoin Foundation, has said is, uh, if you're waiting per for permission to go and do a Bitcoin business, you have it. Go do it. There is no central authority. Certainly not our organization, Bitcoin Foundation, which I joined uh, a few months ago as executive director, um, is one of the most well-known and certainly largest and oldest industry group, but we, we have absolutely no authority over Bitcoin. We don't represent Bitcoin. We don't speak for Bitcoin. We don't give anybody permission or deny anybody permission to do anything other than uh, working to try and represent our membership, which happens to be a pretty broad group of who's who individuals and, and companies in the space. But there is no central authority uh, over Bitcoin in any way. Anyone can do whatever they want in this space. So the cool thing about this is you have all of these venture capitalists, but it's not limited. Uh, they don't need to get permission. They don't need to get authorization. They can just do these investments, not just in the US, but all over the world. I remember when one of the big India conferences came up uh, about maybe a year and a half, two years ago, and there was a lot of people in Europe and the US, they had absolutely no idea there was such a strong community. They, didn't, they never heard of any of these people. And they were kind of like, wow, Where'd these guys come from? I didn't, I didn't know there was hundreds and hundreds of people who were going to attend this thing in India. And, and you know, the, the conference organizers didn't need anybody's permission. They could just do it. And there's a lot of people uh, who are early adopters, some right in this room. A lot of people uh, 
luckily, as fate would have it, in this movement because of uh, speeches that were given by people like Charlie Schramm and Eric Voorhees and Roger Veer a few years ago and, and other reasons, things like Mark's program. The liberty movement has been tied very closely and probably has the highest concentration of early adopters, which is great. And, and many of those early adopters have become very wealthy from Bitcoin and in turn invested it. So there's a lot of big investment into the space that is totally off grid. It doesn't even show up on the, uh, like Andreessen Horowitz's venture capital investment would. Uh, so that's significant. So all of these companies are out there, even the ones that, and many will fail, most will fail statistically, but even the ones that will fail, many of those will further the technology. The ones who come after them will learn what mistakes they made and it will make it easier to do the things where Bitcoin uh, still has some room for improvement, uh, which is um, almost everywhere Bitcoin has room for improvement to make it easier and simpler. And I hope that a few years from now we can look back at today and before and remember the way we look at, at those old email addresses that had the, the long strings of numbers where um, you know, things were just much more difficult. Remember the old modems? You know, if you wanted to, I mean, everybody's connected now. And people are complaining like it's a little hard. Even I was just complaining like, you know, it's a little hard with your Wi-Fi reception. Remember, we didn't even have smartphones just a few years ago. I mean, it's just, what is it? Eight years or something, six years when the first uh, iPhone came out. Um, you know, to have internet on your phone and be able to check mail on your phone. I remember the first time a friend showed me a Blackberry that could do that, and he thought it was so amazing, and it was, it was so unbelievably tedious. I, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Nobody's gonna use this, you know. It was, it was like, a, you know, you could only do it in very, very, very limited areas, and it was, there was no Wi-Fi then. Um, you know, you, you had to do it over the connection, and it was very, very, very tedious. You're talking, you know, five minutes to get three email kind of thing. And, uh, you know, when we first logged on to these you know, it's, it's funny, Prodigy, AOL, and CompuServe were one, at one point the, the really geeky, uh, cutting edge technologies. Later on, they became laughed at as being too basic and then ultimately became obsolete. But it, when those were originally very cutting edge internet technologies, <coughs> it was a process to, to, to get on. You, you had to get a disk and install it and you had to use a, these modems and they make that, that crazy screechy noise. You know, there was no Cat5 cable. There was, there's sure as heck no Wi-Fi. So things have come a long, long way in a very short time. And I think that Bitcoin will do the same because there's so many bright people and so many talented entrepreneurs and engineers that are working to, to push this forward. Um, so a couple more things and then I'll open it for questions. So go ahead and be thinking of your, of your question. I'll just touch on, um, you know, one, one thing that goes with that I'm as bullish and positive about Bitcoin as anyone you can find. S sometimes it makes sense to be grounded. You don't want to end up in the echo chamber of, um, you want to be realistic about where this technology will go and what will happen and how, how things occur. I was a big early internet person. And um, I remember I had a, a client who owned um, something related to uh, printing a newspaper and they were buying a lot of printing presses. And I thought that was absolutely insane. I said, don't they know about the information superhighway? Printing presses are gonna be obsolete. This is crazy. You know, I thought it would happen so fast. And it, it, it has changed print media for sure, but uh, you know, we're looking at 20 plus years ago now, those printers are, are still around. Uh, newspapers still exist. There will be massive, massive change, but when people say things like, you know, Bitcoin is going to destroy all major banks. Yeah, it's, that's a hard road, and it may, it's not gonna happen in five years or 10 years. And more likely, what will happen is, if we look at the internet, Bitcoin it, it is an analogy, in, and, and Bitcoin is like, like the internet with, say, print media or something. What will happen is Bitcoin will destroy a few of the major players, uh, you know, just like digital, um, photography destroyed a few major players, like the direct competitors. Bitcoin may destroy Western Union and a couple other companies, but, but usually the big old established players, they have their claws sunk in very tight into the system and they, they will 
usually adapt and change, and they'll make acquisitions. You know, people say things like uh, Jamie Dimon from J JP Morgan is terrified of Bitcoin. No, he's not. I mean, he's, he's not. I've, I've, I've met a lot of the people, I've met him and met many people in his circles. No, I haven't talked to him about Bitcoin. I'm, I don't want to give the impression that I'm his golfing buddy. Um, but I, I know enough to know how these people think. They're not terif terrified of Bitcoin. Um, they don't view Bitcoin as significant yet. They view it as very insignificant. And from their perspective, and they may have a meeting with a guy who reports to a guy who reports to a guy who deals with Bitcoin in their company, a very relatively junior person. Um, and then the next meeting, they have a, a, a meeting to discuss what's your China expansion strategy, which is a you know, $100 billion play. And all of Bitcoin on planet Earth is worth $5 billion or something like that. So, so th the way that these giant companies think is, yeah, sure, this may work. And what we'll do is we'll, you know, they may not realize how much they may have to adapt. It may kill a couple of them, uh, which would be great. Um, but in general, these companies, they'll wait until these companies are in the space are large and they'll acquire them and integrate them, just, just like was done with the internet. Um, I don't say that to be pessimistic. I'm just saying that's... And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, it, because it is it makes things better than the way they are now, and uh, you can almost view Bitcoin as a bit of a Trojan horse. You know, once it is out there, a lot of the companies who don't really understand the technology don't really realize that it is not like the old days. We, suppose a few years down the road, one of the super banks acquires one of the super huge. Bitcoin companies, which will happen, I, I believe, and they integrate it. Well, what they don't realize is that this is a new type of technology that, that changes all the old rules. When I used to work at Morgan Stanley, if we wanted to transfer an account from Merrill Lynch to Morgan Stanley, it was a big process. We had to fill up a bunch of forms here, they had to fill up a bunch of forms. There's this system called the ACAT system, which all brokerage firms in the country all communicate with to allow to say, you're gonna transfer your account from Schwab to UBS or whatever. They all have to cooperate, and it takes days or weeks. And if anything is different, like a middle initial or an address change or someone's died, it could take a year. Well, with Bitcoin, it, there was, there is, if it's real Bitcoin that the people really own, uh, it will, there is nothing they can do to prevent it from being an instantaneous transaction. So there won't be the, the days of, someone like I was in my early 20s, you know, cold calling, trying to get people to switch from one account to another. Because if they get upset or the bank does something they don't like or they feel there's a better option or the solutions to hold your own Bitcoin on your phone or in cold storage or something like that become at an ease of use and comfort level that not us, but regular folks feel really, really comfortable with, uh, it will take, it, the, the barrier for them to leave is zero. They're just gonna leave. And that's a lot more power in the hands of the people and that, that's really significant. So, so that's you know, one thing. I think um, understanding that this, in my, my opinion anyway, is the most important internet uh, invention since the internet. Um, but to be realistic about how this may unfold by looking at other examples in, in history when, when this kind of thing has happened. Um, and um, so another thing is, uh, that goes with that is you, there tends to be some overzealousness in our space, and I'm guilty of it. I wear this shirt all the time, and my good friend Roger Veer has exactly the same shirt, and I, I believe he wears it for the same reason, because this is one of the most obvious Bitcoin shirts. You can see it from a long way away. And I, I wear it partly just to get like if I'm, especially if I'm gonna be in a public place like a airport, I wear it because I kind of want people to see that logo and be thinking about it. I also like to start conversations with, with people about, about Bitcoin. And uh, so I'm as guilty as anybody about sometimes being a little overzealous about uh, talking about this technology to people. Um, but we should be cautious to not over-focus on adoption, but to let the technology develop. You know, it wouldn't have made a lot of sense to be pushing email down people's throats in 1992. So you've got to try email. You know, tell them about it. Let them try it. But 
the technology and the engineering, I mean, you're better off pushing somebody to say, go be an engineer, go work at one of these companies, go develop solutions. Um, and using Bitcoin yourself, you know, these are things that are probably better than trying to, you know, I, I, I have mixed emotions when I see people <coughs> on uh, a board like Reddit say, you know, finally, after three months, I finally got my local coffee shop to accept Bitcoin. I kind of cringe a little bit because I say, well, you know, how much do you have to harass this poor coffee shop owner? And how much is it going to affect them? You're going to buy it with Bitcoin, but you were buying it anyway. So at the end of the year, they may say, you know, okay, we made an extra $40. And it was kind of a pain because we had to train people. You know, it's better to just kind of let the technology work, make better and better solutions and, and let it uh, flow. So those are just a couple thoughts that I had. Um, we'll go ahead and open it to questions. We have a little bit more time. Go ahead. I, I just like what you mentioned there to, to let people uh, accept it and see it for, for what it is, the value that it has. And, and I do see a lot of evangelizing. And, and when, you, when you get religious about an idea, it, it almost seems like to the person, just an observation from, from me, it, it seems like it's not worth it, you know, like not worth their time. Like you're, try, you're having to yeah. push it on them, you know? So like, I, I really agree. I agree with that. I just want to. Yeah, think. definitely. I mean, I think, um, I've, I've had conversation. I was at a little, very similar to the coffee shop story. There's a little shop that I go to all the time. I buy the, uh, you know, healthy uh, green drink, juice drinks. And I said, you gotta accept, you gotta accept Bitcoin. I started telling them about Bitcoin and I could see the owner was just kind of like, what, what, so do you sell Bitcoin? Are you trying to get me to sign up for something? They were kind of backing up. And, and it was before I was with the, the foundation, it would have been even worse because I would have been like, well, I'm with an organization, but I'm not trying to sell you anything. It, it, you know, it would have hurt my credibility and, and not helped. So, um, so you got to kind of tone it down. And the best thing to do is you get a conversation with somebody, tell them about it, and just get them to open a wallet. Say, T take out your phone, download a wallet, I'll send you a dollar. And you send it to them, you show them, and that will accomplish way more than I just accomplished in talking for a half an hour. You, you can do it in two minutes. Um, my son, Alexander here, he, uh, he did that for one of his teachers, um, set up a wallet for her and sent her Bitcoin within a minute. He, he owns some Bitcoin because he has his own little Bitcoin business because they wouldn't let him have a credit card, but he's able to have Bitcoin. Right, <laughs> and, uh, and he has his own financial independence with that. He wanted to, for, for ages, he wanted to get um, Xbox Live account. And I said, yeah, I'm not real huge on supporting video games. I, you know, I'm not gonna pay for it. Uh, you know, I'll let you play a little bit. But once he had his own Bitcoin, and he found out Microsoft accepted it. He didn't need my permission anymore. He just went, put his code on there. He bought his own Xbox Live account. So uh, that's the power of it. Uh, thanks for your talk. I, I'm, I'm really new to Bitcoin. I've been doing my own independent research, and one of the things I came across in doing that was somebody brought up the question of, of at some point, the ledger is going to be so big, it'll take up more memory than you can, than it can handle, than your resources can handle. What, how, can you answer, talk to that? Sure, yeah. So the question is, will, you know, will this ledger become so huge that it's impossible to handle? And there's actually a lot of uh, debate going on right now. Um, and I, uh, with my position with the foundation, because we represent such a broad membership that, and uh, if you're, who's really active in the space so much that you know about this uh, block size debate? I mean, it's, uh, it, it's it, the, the people outside the space are almost laughing at it because it's so, you know, it's like the old joke they say about academia, the, the, the infighting is so fierce because the stakes are so low. Um, the, uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, but, but I don't mean to make light of it. I mean, there's very, very, very smart people who are very passionate about this and, and, and fighting quite a bit about what the solution is. So because we try and represent all of these members, we are not going to take an official position on which solution is the best. Uh, Gavin Andreessen is, is, uh, was employed by the foundation for many years, is now employed by MIT, but he still serves as chief scientist of the Bitcoin Foundation. He has very strong opinions, but there's a lot of other members who also have strong opinions. But anyway, so aside from the exact specifics of how it will be solved, uh, there are a lot of solutions looking at ways to solve this. One is that computers are getting more and more powerful all the time. Um, there are ways to 
prune pieces of the blockchain so that you don't, you don't necessarily need every single computer all the time to have this entire record of history going back to you know, early transactions in 2011 and so on. Uh, so anyway, yeah, yeah, it is, it is a challenge. It's not, there are, there are certain things, one of our board members, Jim Harper, has done a study on, you know, threats and risks to Bitcoin, looking at regulation and other issues that could threaten the space. <coughs> it's not a huge issue of concern. Uh, pretty much my feeling is that uh, it, one of these solutions is going to come forward. It will be decided on probably pretty soon, and that's going to pretty much solve it. So I don't, I don't view that being a big challenge a big big threat to Bitcoin. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the uh, Bitcoin memberships uh, and the, the foundation's memberships and what how it benefits businesses, small businesses in particular? Sure. The, um, the question is uh, talking a little bit about the Bitcoin Foundation membership. So like I said, the Bitcoin Foundation, uh, there is no official head of Bitcoin or organization that runs Bitcoin or anything like that. We just happen to be the oldest and largest uh, nonprofit group in the space. And um, to join, I believe it's uh, $25 for an individual per year or the lifetime membership is 100-ish. The reason I don't know the exact numbers is because we're just in the process of changing them. Uh, and then there are corporate memberships at the ranging from 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, all the way to $25,000. Or there has been a couple in the past who've even done $100,000 memberships for corporate memberships. Um, so you can go to the, 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 uh, the website is actually being updated. One of the things that I did as executive director was kind of update that and change that. And then unfortunately I was in this accident, so it slowed down a little bit, but, um, yeah, that'll be kind of, kind of going and, and, you know, if, if you like, uh, you know, you know, Bitcoin and, and the space, it's, it's, you know, especially with the cheap individual membership, you know, I'd recommend it. As a storefront business owner, I'd like to accept Bitcoin, but the problem is I have a lot of employees and there are a lot of turn there's a lot of turnover of employees. And so um, could you comment perhaps on the security like as a business owner and other business owners I speak to would also like to accept it, but they say, well, you know, if I give employees the private key, it's a little bit like giving them access to my business bank account. Whereas with the debit machine or credit machine, you know, the bank's responsible for it if there's, you know, fraud or a problem or whatever. How do you think the market's going to provide services to business owners to kind of simplify the process so that, you know, employees can be trained quick and that it's safe, you know, they can't just steal all your Bitcoin and leave. Sure. Yeah, um, great question. So basically, some of the security concerns around accepting Bitcoin as a small business owner, you wouldn't have to worry about the private key issue because you wouldn't give employees the private key. You, you, it's very easy for you to have a, your own Bitcoin address and you can make the public part public and they don't have to have access to the backend. I, I mean, for them to re verify that the payment has gone through before providing the service. Yeah, they would be able to do that just with a public address. I, could, I have a public address right here. For times that I need somebody to send me money and I don't have uh, Wi-Fi, I just carry this thing around. I put a magic card on the back, which is an inside joke for people who know the many connections that Magic the Gathering has with Bitcoin, including unfortunately one of the worst disasters in Bitcoin being uh, Mt. Gox, which was originally an exchange for Magic cards and became an exchange for Bitcoin and then collapsed. But anyway, I have this, this code. I, you can show this code to anybody. There's absolutely positively no way that anyone can hack this code. There's just no way. Um, and, and when I first got into Bitcoin, I said, ah, oh, come on, it's a computer, it can be hacked. Well, this number here, the equivalent of this private key, if you just counted that high on a machine, the fastest machine known to man now, to just count that high, forget about cracking it, it would take something like 100 times the expected length that the sun will burn. I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen. They can't crack it. So you can show this with total security to anyone. Um, and, and if, these, if anything close to this level of code is ever crackable, basically the world will end. I mean, you know, nuclear codes, not, nothing would, would work. This is way, 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 way more secure than, uh, you know, major banks or governments or anything else. So anyway, you can show this to people. You can show your private key to people, or your, I'm sorry, <laughs> your public key to people, and they can send money to it, and you can verify it. So if, if somebody in, in the audience sent me a dollar here, I could look at the blockchain on my phone and see 
uh, right away that it went through. And then 10 minutes later, I'd see kind of a first confirmation. And, and uh, depending on how secure you want to be to make, like if you were selling uh, something very, very high ticket, like a big pile of gold that they can just take and run, uh, you would want to really make sure that, you know, th that it's confirmed a few times. Uh, because there is a theoretical chance that like, you know, they send it to you, but they also send it to somebody else. It's very, very hard. It's happened very, very, very rarely. And, and once it's past 10 minutes, it's way less. And once it's past 60 minutes, it will never, ever happen. So anyway, you, you, you could, you wouldn't need to show you, have your employees show your private key. There are other dangers of it. Like they could just say, we accept Bitcoin and same way that they could pocket cash and not tell you about it. Uh, they could have their own wallet. And, and show their own code. You, and unless it's a very trackable product, you don't even know that they do it. So there are good companies like BitPay who are working very hard to solve these things. Make it, the other thing, what I thought you were gonna mention when you said you had high turnover is training. Um, if you can integrate it with one of your existing payment platform systems, that's perfect. But if you have to have another training thing, which for fr frankly is probably gonna be a small piece of your business, unless you're you know, some kind of liberty-oriented thing where a huge percentage of your customers or technology where a huge percentage of your customers use Bitcoin, you gotta go ahead and train these people. Like, okay, if somebody comes in with Bitcoin, here's what you do, you pull out the iPad and you do this and this and this. And uh, they may not get a lot of, like if it's a restaurant or something, you may not get a lot of Bitcoin sales. And, uh, and, and that, you know, that's a challenge because they're gonna forget how to use it. So, so there are some challenges. The good news is, you know, definitely look at Bit, BitPay, GoCoin, some of these companies. There are really smart people working on this really, really hard right now. There are hundreds of people working on this right now to make it, it's doable now. Um, may not be easy, may have some drawbacks, but it's getting better and better and better every day. Bernard. Yeah, Bruce, what's the latest on BitGold? BitGold? The, the, you mean the original one from years ago or? No, that, there's, it's been popping up in the news recently, so I, I was just cr curious about it. I'm not sure of anything. I've been a little out of the recent news thing, so I'm not really sure. What, what do you know about it? Um, that's why I'm asking you, yeah. Bruce. <laughs> yeah, I, I, okay. I'm at a, it's cool. I'm at a bit of a lot. You know, I think I've heard of, I know there was a bit gold as a predecessor to Bitcoin a long time ago. Yeah, no, this is much more recent. Okay. I, and I know that there were the, the assets of one of, there was a couple of these bit gold kind of companies that sort of preceded Bitcoin and then came, another one came along kind of around the time of Bitcoin and they had different problems with the government and issues. And I heard about a year and a half ago that somebody was gonna buy the assets of those and kind of try and re jump start it on, on the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, that may be what it is, but I'm not, I'm not really sure. I wish I, wish I knew. Okay, thanks. thanks. Um, what, in your mind, what are the main points of failure of Bitcoin? What are you most worried about? What am I most worried about, about the main points of failure with Bitcoin? Uh, unfortunately, regulation is, is one of the biggest threats, in my opinion. Um, we have this very burdensome regulation which came out of New York and unfortunately has been copied by a couple states. It's um, the equivalent of trying to take email and it, when email came along, say, okay, you, you're allowed to send emails as long as you use a stamp and you log it in your log book at home. I mean, it's, you know, annoying stuff. I don't think these kind of regulations are enough to really significantly harm Bitcoin or certainly kill Bitcoin. But uh, the fact is regulation could be a major threat. If we had a few bad things happen, suppose we had a major terrorist attack that was clearly funded by Bitcoin. And we had the kind of irrational reactions that we've had in the past to other tragedy. And someone said, okay, owning Bitcoin in the United States is now a felony. That's it. And, and you know, like they do in times of tragedy, Congress rushes and passes some thousand page bill written by the banks, uh, which they, they do. That's, that's what they do in times of tragedy. That, that, kind of thing could really hurt Bitcoin. I like to say, hey, uh, you know, let's fight the system and everything, but as, as uh, radical as I may be, as anarchist as I may be, as big of a mouth as I may have, as passionate about Bitcoin as I may have, if you made it a felony to own Bitcoin in the United States, I wouldn't own Bitcoin in the United States. And that's me. You know, so that would pretty much kill it uh, for, for many people. Um, if you had it in a major, major country like that, you want to come up?
Oh, yeah. I mean, you could go into another coin. I, I think if you had that type of... If, and that's a, that's a pretty... Uh, it's a less and less likely scenario as we go, especially as there's more serious venture capitalists and more of the... Uh, Ironically, the old establishment, like the uh, New York Stock Exchange and Goldman Sachs, who are becoming involved in this, that actually makes it less likely. Um, but I think if we did have some kind of onerous, crazy regulation, it would be similar to New York, where they didn't just single out Bitcoin. They said Bitcoin and anything similar to Bitcoin, any kind of similar coin. So regulation is, is one thing. The other thing is that I, I say we should always uh, be mindful of with Bitcoin is this is new and uncharted territory. And because of that, there are things that we just don't know and maybe nobody has thought of. I mean, you can't say that we've thought of everything. I think I'm out of time. But um, I, we can't say we've thought of everything in this space because it's new. Nobody ever heard of Bitcoin until six years ago or so. Um, so it's a new and incredible thing. And because of that, we just don't know what will happen. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I'll stick around if you have any other questions. Thanks.